So let me be straight. As a nail. Frank. As a guy named Frank. I left the town of nobody and nothing. All alone and abandoned. Literally crawled through a fuck ton of food to make it through this tiny ass hole that I may have been able to fit through when I was like eight. Got through a roller coaster of fucked up shit and banshees screaming at me, feeling my life was going to end at any second. Came through to the unofficial, unless you work for them, in which case it's very fucking official, headquarters of the Ostium Network, where hundreds of people, possibly as many as a thousand, work. Only to discover I'm all on my own again. Wow. This is just... Great. Real fucking great. I suppose I should look on the bright side, right? Well, first I need to find the bright side. Before I was stuck in Ostium by my lonesome, now I've got a whole fucking island to myself. Plus a goddamn mountain of rock. Is the Rock of Gibraltar really considered a mountain? Or is it just a really pronounced hill? Well, I guess just hearing Jake's imaginary voice, the voice of my subconscious, was enough to jumpstart his whole shtick in my head. Wait. Wait a second. Okay, good. Seems like Jake's not at home. For now. Only when shit's going down, apparently. Okay. Taking the good with the bad here. So where should we go first, since we've got the whole fucking place to ourselves? How about some of those spots they didn't want any of us non-specially trained going? Sounds good to me. We only got to see Ostium that one time, really. When they took us through to check it out. We went through, one by one, using the special door in that special room. The one I ran to when I went after Steve, trying to get him back. I thought there was just one of them, you know, doors, Stargate thingies, flux capacitor rooms, whatever you want to call it, a transportation vessel, (laughs) bunch of fancy words for a door that took you directly to Ostium. The way the bigwigs made it sound, with them letting us go through, what a big fucking deal it all was. This was breaking new ground. Bullshit, etc. Bullshit, etc. You'd think they had just the one room to do it with. Uh Uh-uh. Apparently not. After I stepped through into the Ostium Network with my life intact, set foot on the great island of Gibraltar, after I did my whole song and dance routine of breathing fresh air, then looking for another living soul and not finding a single one... Then, fully appreciating the utter fucking badness of it all, I took a few deep breaths, got my shit together, and went back inside to have a look around. I was methodical, going back to the point of origin, where I came through. It's a lot like the one I went through before, a room with a conjoined booth, window looking in so observers can watch anyone going through, or in this case... Sending food and supplies through the special small hole. And after that, does it magically appear at the very back of that crazy pantry in Ostium? Because when I tried it, I went on one crazy fucked up roller coaster of emotion and banshee bantering. (laughs) As I already mentioned, obviously the food passing through doesn't get the scenic tour. So is that just for my benefit? My hindrance? Was that Ostium trying to not just fuck with me, but completely throw me off track? If so, why? What's Ostium got against me? I know we don't have the connection, the witty repartee, the broness quality of Mr. Jake Fisher, but we've got something, no? After all this time? I think I'm reaching here. But I made it through. In one piece. Mostly. I think with my sanity intact. Still checking on that. So, 
back to looking around. As I said, I want to be thorough about this. Because that's how Jake would be. That's how Jake would have wanted me to do it. I find more rooms. With doors. Lots more. I count up to twelve by the time I've searched the whole big building. All with unmarked doors. Do they all lead to Ostium? What the hell were they planning here? I remember asking in class that day, what feels like a billion years ago now, about what the point of all this was. What Mr. Incognito running the Ostium network wanted to get out of it. In my mind, I was thinking, what's the money angle? How's this guy going to become even richer? And I, along with the rest of the class, was misdirected and distracted, made to think it was not important. Well, feels pretty fucking important now, seeing all these rooms. How many fucking people did they want going into Ostium? Were they going to send us all in at the same time? Going through our most desired doors, fulfilling our goals and coming back to tell about it? What the fuck did they want out of it? And that's when a scary thought comes to mind. The kind that turns your blood cold. Yeah, it's an expression. But I'm also fucking feeling it right now. During my immersion research, I was very fucking thorough, as I said. Even watched a bunch of animated movies. Covered all my bases. One of them was called Monsters, Inc. About a company that employs monsters to go through... Because I shit you not. Doors. I know. They go through doors and come out of closets to scare little children half to death. What do they get out of it? Power. Energy. The fear and the terror is harnessed somehow and helps to power the city where the monsters live. Yeah, pretty fucked up, I know. And this was a goddamn kids movie. So is that what's going on here? Are they getting something... I don't know. Metaphysical out of us going through the doors? Why have so many of them in Ostium? And have so many set up here to send us through? Why have that whole home base set up with all the fucking food? All the better to keep you fed and busy going through doors, my dear. I don't know. It does seem pretty far-fetched, but there had to be some angle. Oh, wait. I got it. Clearly. This was all going to be research for a new time-traveling reference guide. No? Talk about hands-on research. In fucking C2. I don't know if I'll ever know the why. What I do know is I'm in the right place to have any chance of finding out. So let's keep looking then, shall we? I'm outside again. The sun feels amazing. Being in Ostium that long without it affected me more than I thought. I think Jake had some introspections on whether we'd be getting enough vitamin D without the sun, or whether Ostium had figured out a way to replace that. Otherwise, we'd start feeling pretty weak. I don't know. It feels glorious right now. And the sea air is just making me feel renewed full of life. Oh, okay. What were we doing? Right. Heading this way, which I think is north along uh, Linewall Road looks like to Winston Churchill Road. Yep, kind of bizarre thinking on it now that the Ostium Network created this whole new civilization basically on this island but didn't bother to rename the streets or anything. I mean, I guess the names they already have are fine, but as you can see, they relate to things like walls and long-dead prime ministers. It just feels really fucking out of context. So, why am I heading this way? Well, I'll let you know in just a second. And, uh... Oh... Well, I guess that fucking solves that, then. I'm at the edge of the island. A part where the land meets the sea. It's a significant part. 
It's where there's a small dock made to fit just one boat. A special, unique boat. The one that brought Steve and I here. A very, very, very long time ago. I had a hope. No, that's not true. Or honest. I had a vague fucking inkling that I thought would turn out to be bullshit. I was right. There's no boat. No sign of any boat or anything being here in a long fucking time. The stanchions are bare and really crusted over with shit. I guess one has this short piece of rope that looks like something the ancient mariner was carrying around with him. No one's been here or used this dock in a long fucking time. Well, I didn't expect anything. And that's what I found. So what's that endearing saying? No harm, no foul. Yeah. I feel just fucking great right now. Moving on to the next clue of this truly fucked up scavenger hunt. Next up is my old haunt. I know it's pretty far from the dock, so I walk for a while in search of one of those self-driving cars. Doesn't take me long. I hop in, the key's in the ignition. I close my eyes and turn the key, count to ten and then open them. There are lights! A good sign. I put it in drive and switch to manual, then step on the accelerator and the thing launches into life, throwing me back and almost out of the damn thing. I hit the brakes and stop, then put on my seatbelt. <laughs> that would have been just fan fucking tastic, falling out and breaking my arm or something, with no one around to help. Least I would have known where the infirmary was, not that I could have done anything. But we're okay, for now. That's the important thing. I hit the pedal again and zip along through empty streets. It's fucking creepy, man. Even creepier than Ostium, if that can be believed. All the empty, abandoned buildings on both sides of the road. It's like... It's like they're all staring down at me. Judging me or something. For what? Fuck knows. I'm just on edge, that's all. I hope that's all. This thing sounds fucking noisy, which is crazy, because I know how damn quiet they actually are. I never really heard them when I was here back when there were people all around living and doing things. Now it sounds like I'm driving a big rig. I then recognize the building, even though it looks kind of like all the others. I hit the brakes, letting out a nice echoing screech, nice and loud. It feels better than the sound of the EV and nothing else, somehow. Maybe because it's real fucking loud and I made it happen. I step up to the door and realize something incredibly stupid. It's locked. The way we usually got in is with a special chip they put in our wrists. They said it wasn't really to track us or anything, but the look in their eyes said it was definitely for that. But it also had a unique biosignature to each individual person, so I just needed to wave my hand in front of the panel and... Good. It still works. That's really good. I was going to have to try and kick the fucking thing down, which wouldn't have been easy. It looks tough. I step inside and notice the smell right away. Dusty, stuffy, empty. Feels like it's been abandoned for a while, not lived in. But then I pick up other scents. It's me. Subtle hints. My perfume. My shampoo, maybe? Coffee. Oh God, coffee! I charge into the small kitchen. I can hear the high-pitched humming of the fridge. Oh God, yes! There's power. Hopefully that goes for the entire island. If so, living here for the indefinite period just got a lot fucking better. Fifteen minutes later, I have a French press full of fresh, divine-smelling coffee. Yes, I know. I'm the tea addict. Proclaiming my love for coffee is sacrilegious. 
anathema. But that's partly because I knew I couldn't get any in ostium. Tea, yes, by the buttload, because it was necessary, and tasted just fine. But coffee, oh, be still my heart. It has no important or redeeming qualities other than it smells heavenly, tastes almost as good, and makes me feel on top of the world. I fill a mug, my hands know where to go to find one, and add sugar, which also looks fine. I take a sip. Oh, then another. Then five more in quick succession. My lips are burning, my throat is on fire. But like I said, I'm the queen of the fucking world. Soon the first mug is empty and I'm filling another. Then I take my trip down memory lane, my heart running ahead of me due to nerves, but also due to lovely sustaining caffeine. Everything looks just like I left it. Furniture, trinkets, what little I'd been able to acquire. My bedroom is the same. Clothes! Clothes! I have my entire wardrobe again. Holy shit snacks. <laughs> this day just keeps getting better and fucking better. I take that as a cue and hop into the bathroom, turning on the water. In eight seconds, it turns scalding. I adjust the temperature, strip down, and hop in. My soap and shampoo are there, right next to the conditioner. Twelve minutes later, I come out feeling even better, if that's possible. I put on some fresh jeans, a tank top, and hoodie. Oh, gosh, this feels so great. I grab my mug of coffee from my bedside table, and as I'm about to take a lukewarm sip, I stop. Then put the mug down, almost dropping it. Right next to it, looking slim and innocent, is my data pad. I'd totally forgotten... No, another lie to myself. i just given up hoping to ever (sighs) I pick it up and it comes to life it's been comfortably lying on the charging pad for a very long time the battery is full it's connected to the network I'm able to do all the usual stuff but there are no recent messages not since oh shit the last message was received on August 3rd, 10 years ago. What does this mean? I can't have been gone that long. It's fucking impossible. It's It's been, what, weeks? A month. Two months at most. But still feels more like a couple weeks. No more. It just... just doesn't make any fucking sense. How? How? I guess... I guess that explains the stuffy feeling of the apartment. But the coffee... Maybe it wasn't as great tasting as I thought. No, no, it tasted fucking great. Must have just had it well sealed or something. Wow. This is, uh... uh, A fucking mind trip. (laughs) I can really use Jakey at my side right now. For comfort. And to, to science this shit out somehow. Try to make some sense of it make a bad pun or joke. Damn. Not much to be done about it now. I switch to the journal setting and find my last entry. From the night before I learned about Steve and went into Ostium for the first time. They said they're very close now. Almost ready to send someone through to Ostium. I don't know who it's going to be, but not me. That's for sure. I still haven't decided when or where I want to go. And last time I talked to Steve, he was in the same boat. (laughs) Kid's so goddamn excited. But who can blame him? I am too. We all are. So they won't be sending him in either then. Will it be one of the few who are certain what they want? I wonder if they'll keep us informed and up to date. On how the person does. 
I'm guessing the person won't be going for very long, it being the first time and all. Whoever it is, they gotta know by now, must be petrified. And over the moon at the same time. What a trip it's going to be. Historical. And if they're going back in time, then in every sense of the word. Today was a low-key day, work-wise. We're all pretty much ready, except for deciding the when and the where. I'm starting to think I want somewhere in the late 1980s or in the 1990s. Maybe the fall of the Berlin Wall. That would be pretty cool. Or be there at the death of Lady Diana, just to see if it did all happen, as they said. Or maybe check out some of President Clinton's sax playing. (laughs) Ha! No thanks. It's hard. I know I'm going to get lots of opportunities to go, to different times and places. They've made that clear to all of us, so long as nothing goes wrong. But I want that first time to be special. Yes, I want losing my ostium virginity to be fucking special, all right? (laughs) Jeez, (laughs) I sound ridiculous. Ah, bet I'm not the only one sweating over this, though. Okay, my eyes are getting droopy. Time to put my head down and get some shut-eye. Maybe during the night I'll have some magical dream that'll make it all clear for me, and come morning, I'll know exactly where I want to go. Only time will tell. Once I'm done, I can feel the wetness on my cheeks. I've been fucking crying. Wow. I didn't expect that. But this is from so long ago. And I was in such a different place. Such a different frame of mind then. So fucking hopeful and excited about the future. And then they fucked it all up and changed everything. Okay. Deep breaths. No use moping over it. Fuck all I can really do about it now. I put the data pad back and grab the mug and head downstairs. After cleaning things up, I head out the door and back into the EV. Time to do a little more sightseeing. I've got no plan at the moment. Just driving around kind of randomly. Sort of a trip down memory lane, but also feeling like no one's holding me back and I can go where the fuck I want. Go through whatever door I want. No one telling me, no, I can't go that way, not allowed. Access fucking denied. Well, not anymore. And then I see a building I've never been in before. I remember... I remember wanting to go in. Not because I wanted to find out what was inside, but because I just wanted to be allowed. I didn't want to see another mysterious stranger telling me I wasn't allowed. Like a little fucking kid. It's a pretty big building. Multiple floors. No clue what it is. (laughs) But I'm about to find out. Park the EV and hop out. There's a door. Here's hoping it's unlocked. Bingo. Let's see what's behind door number... You know what? I'm just not gonna finish that thought. So what do we got here? A sort of entryway. Closets. A kitchen. Okay. Guess they mostly do their own food here instead of going to one of the truly fabulous eateries in town. And now we've got a... Whoa. A fucking game room. What the fuck? Foosball, billiards, even fucking air hockey. What the hell is this place? They never told us about anything like this. It was all work and study and more work and more study with very little fun time. If I knew this place was here, well, I don't know how much I'd be here, but I'd at least like the option. Damn, this place is huge. Who would you need a place like this for? It'd have to be for a big group. Like a... Like a... I think I know what this place is. 
but I'm not going to say yet. It doesn't take me long to find the stairs. When I make it to the top, I'm not surprised by what I find. A big open floor filled with bunk beds in two perfectly straight rows, a clear walkway in between them. At the far end is a closed-off room where I'm certain I'll find a bathroom much like a college dorm, toilets and showers. The quiet seems thicker somehow up here. It's probably more about what my brain is doing than what's physically happening, but still, it's heavy on me, pushing down. Almost palpable. I take a couple of deep breaths and start slowly walking down the central walkway. Each bunk bed is an exact mirror image to the one on either side of it and the ones across from it. Two stacked beds, two bedside tables. Along the walls where I first came in are closets that each bear nameplates, just like the beds do, names belonging to their owners. By the third bunk bed, I recognize the name, Tanaka. An unstoppable image slams into my mind, almost knocking me over. I rest my hand against the bunk bed, steadying myself as the memories come unbidden. The starship, being with Jake, walking along a hallway of doors, getting into an elevator. Jake called it a turbo lift or ugh, space vader. He said bridge and it magically took us there and there were consoles and beeps and other sounds and a screen showing distant stars. And the body. Private Tanaka. Hanging over the console like a... like a piece of forgotten laundry. Like a child's coat left on the floor of the playground on the last day of school. Not important. Unwanted. I'm stable again. Able to walk. I keep going all the way to the end. This place should fucking stink. Of sweat. Of men. Of soldiers. Of dudes doing dude things. Eau de testosterone. But it doesn't. It's stale and dusty and abandoned like my place, like no one's been here in ten years. Once again, I have to ask, what the fuck? I head back downstairs and leave the building. I'm done with this place, for good. I got no plans to ever come back. Good fucking riddance. And in case you're wondering, yes, they're all there. The names to all the bodies we found on the other side of the doors in Ostium. Private Tanaka, Private Kaling, Private Ramirez, even fucking Sergeant Harris. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised he was bunking with the rest of the guys. With one of his rank and stature, he should have had his own place to shack up. I wonder if that was an on-high decision for him to be with his men, or his own choice just another one of those things I'll never know. I don't fucking care about either. You know, I'm I'm really fucking hungry. I can't remember the last time I ate anything. There was the coffee, and before that, I just don't remember. So why don't we go visit one of the Rock's two fashionable and very chic restaurants? Ostium Network approved, of course. The one I'm not going to is called, and I kid you not, A Little Piece of Heaven. Yep, those Ostium Network peeps sure had a sense of humor about them. But wait till you hear the name of the place I'm actually going to. Ready for it? Are you sure? I'm warning you, it's pretty fucking bad. Okay, here goes. The cut of the jib. Yes, I I shit you not. Fucking terrible, I know, but it was closer to my place, so it's where I tended to go more often than elsewhere. 
Back in the self-driving EV, I turn it to automatic and select the name from a list of places. It's the second one down because you tend to want food first and foremost, and other shit second. It takes less than five minutes and I'm there. No problem finding parking. Big surprise. When I get to the door, I turn the handle and pull. It doesn't move at first, but there's a little give. It tells me it isn't actually locked. I spread my feet apart, brace myself, then give it a good yank. It lets out a gasp of air and opens like a long human sigh. The inside has been sealed, probably for around 10 years. I wonder what that means for the food. If the electricity has been going the whole time, we may be in some sort of luck. I don't know. Speaking of which, it's totally fucking awesome there's still power in this place. But who's paying the bills? What does it run on? Hydroelectric? Tidal? Fucking nuclear power? It's a question I never asked, but now I kind of wished I had. Just to know, in case this place goes into meltdown or something. You know. Well, that thought is just too fucking depressing, so I'm just going to ignore it for now. Stick it in the back of my brain and pretend it's not there. Like I've done with so many other things related to Ostium. The place smells clean and untouched, but different. Not stale and dusty. Maybe that door was keeping the place hermetically sealed somehow. I go behind the counter and into the kitchen and hear lots of humming from fridges and freezers. I open heavy metal doors to a cloud of icy air and racks of meat and foods. Some frozen, others well cooled for over a decade apparently. Most of them appear to be vacuum sealed as well. I grab a heavy pack of what appears to be teriyaki chicken. The label tells me that it is, and the expiration date on it is 20 fucking years from now? What the hell? Do I dare eat this stuff? says it's okay. What kind of shit have they been doing here? I was always wondering where the Ostium Network got their food from exactly. Have they been specifically making this stuff for like 50 years? There's no package date, so for all I know, this shit could be a hundred years old. But I'm fucking hungry. Starving. I'm gonna try it. But I'm also going to keep close to a bathroom. In less than 10 minutes, I've got electric burners going and I'm frying up that chicken in its own sauce as well as steaming some vegetables. 15 minutes later, I sit down to eat with a bottle of wine I find. No worries about that being bad, although it does give a whole new meaning to the term vintage. The meal is... ah, delicious. Everything tastes heavenly, even though this establishment isn't a little piece of heaven. I find a completely untouched five-layer chocolate cake that I snag myself a hefty slice of, along with some fresh coffee which also smells and tastes, you guessed it, heavenly. Then I sit down and relax for half an hour, letting the food go down as the saying goes, but also making sure my stomach and bowels don't decide to stage a coup against the rest of my organs. I haven't felt this full in a long time. Not since, uh, what was that little town closest to Ostium called? Camarillo? Carrillo? Covello. That was it. My moment of revelry is broken by a loud noise. It sounds like a crack of thunder, only more echoing. Not right in some way. I leap out of my seat and burst out the doors. The sky above is still a beautiful blue, not a cloud in sight. I'm looking around for... something. Dust, smoke, fucking gas, I don't know. Some sort of origin to that nasty sound. But I can't see anything out of the ordinary. What the fuck?
When enough time has passed that I've deemed my body and all its internal organs alive and well, I use the facilities, and then I'm back in the self-driving car, trying to decide what the last stop of the day should be before I call it and head for home. I'm checking the locations menu again, scrolling through alphabetically. I'm working through the C's and stop when I see a word that just doesn't fit. It's not part of the great Ostium Network jigsaw. It's a word I just never expected to hear or ever read in this context. Cemetery. No one has ever talked to me about a cemetery in relation to Ostium or on the rock in any way. Not from a teacher, not in a class. Not in conversation with friends, acquaintances, or strangers. There was that story, that urban legend about the guy who wanted to quit. I think I talked about it in a recording. One of the teachers told us about him, how he jumped in the water and just started swimming. Is it true? I don't think so. What I do know is that he's the only case of someone dying here, from what they've told us. With the number of people we've had on the island, yeah, sure, a cemetery just makes sense. People are going to fucking die. It's the one sure thing in this life. Right? Right? So you need a place to stash the dead. Unless there's something they never told us. A big fucking something. I hit the button and then I'm on my way to the Ostium Cemetery. It takes a while, at the far end of the island. A good 15 minutes by self-driving vehicle. I could have done it in 10 on manual, if I'd known where I was going. It's not big, at least not as far as cemeteries go. But I'm shocked as soon as I step through the open gateway. There's at least 50 tombstones here. All simple bright white stone, looks like marble. All with the person's name on it, no other details. I get flashbacks of walking through the barracks as I study the tombstones, seeing names again. And then I see familiar ones that stop me in my tracks. Richard Kalin, Jose Ramirez, Kenzo Tanaka, Robert Harris. Shit. They're here. They're all here. I recognize other names, too. Lots of them. Not just the security team. But scientists, co-workers, classmates. People I saw and worked and talked with. Almost every day here. Now, all buried and gone. Then I see two more tombstones at the end of a row, next to each other. Stephen Chase. Monica Chase. That's when I start shaking uncontrollably. I fall, just catching myself from mashing my face into the top of the tombstone. It's Steve's that's holding me up right now. I'm hanging over it, slumped over the tombstone of my dead son. Like a piece of laundry. A forgotten kid's jacket. I can't believe we're here, the Rock of Gibraltar, one of the pillars of Hercules, the gateway to the Atlantic, the doorway to the Mediterranean. And speaking of doorway, I turn around looking behind me to see if there's anything, but there's no indication of the rip or rift I created, what I made that was somehow able to get us from that place in Fort Bragg to here. I'm still not sure exactly how I did uh, all of that. I was so goddamn scared at the end there, with that lady, that thing, coming for us. I don't know what it would have done to us, but I've got an idea of what it's capable of. Yeah, you remember the bodies? The state of the bodies in that house in Fort Bragg where we found them that first time? Life-destroying. Soul-destroying. I'm never going to get over it, and even if I wanted to, I could never forget it. Yeah, two words. 
photographic memory. And that's the only time I'm going to mention it, in this recording at least. Hey, it's a new place, a new world. So it's like I have a clean slate, a tabula rasa, if you will, to wax poetic on my photographic memory. Eidetic? Isn't that another way to say it? And now Dave's giving me one of his, um, what would he call it? Bloody pissed off looks? Oh good, now he's smirking. Must have said the right thing. So where shall we start, I ask. He pauses for a number of seconds, eyes wide, and then says, How should I bloody know? I don't live here, do I? No, but I thought you know, since they speak English here and have a lot of British expatriates, you might know a thing or two about it. Well, I bloody don't. Yes, they have a lot of expats down here, but I've never been one of them. No bloody clue, mate. I've travelled around a bit, but not to here. And I don't see another living soul around. As per usual with anything related to Ostium. So... Your guess is as good as mine. What does the great Jake Fisher think about all this? The sarcasm is oozing out like fucking authentic Canadian maple syrup. I'm going to give the guy some space. You know, I say, let me think about all this for a bit. Need some physical as well as mental space. Fine, mate. Take all the time you need. I need to sift through my mangled thoughts, too. I step away out of earshot. Dave seems to be going through something. I don't know what. We've been through a lot of shit in the last 24 hours. Him just as much as me, according to his wild ride of a story. He saw that... Crone? I don't know what to call her or it, so I'll stick with Crone for now. It was definitely female, but also definitely not human. I suppose it will be more accurate to say that it had the outward appearance, the visible features of a woman but that was as far as it went. So Dave can have some private time to try and process all this, being where we are now and all that. And it gives me some time to process all this too. I really need to think about everything that's happened and try to digest it in some way. All the shit that happened to me when the blackness got me. I don't know what the fuck it all was. I don't think I'm ever going to really know. It was some sort of messed up journey. A pilgrimage, maybe? No, that implies spirituality, and I didn't feel anything spiritual going on there. It just, it just happened, whatever the fuck it all was. And after that, there was Roanoke, again, somehow, and Dave there, again, somehow. I suppose I should address my, uh, what should we call them, changes? Upgrades, improvements, enhancements. I sound like a goddamn transformer. Or a version of Windows. Don't worry, like Windows, I still have plenty of problems to deal with on my own. I just hope I don't start crashing all the time. Blue screen of death and all that. But when I was there in Roanoke, I felt changed somehow. Things were just clearer to me, mentally. It was like I had gotten more of the big picture and it had all started making sense to me now. No, don't ask for details. I can't give you anything concrete. Just these vague platitudes. But I feel stronger. Dare I say, more powerful? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I do feel stronger and more able to handle all this, to deal with what Ostium throws at me. So when I knew we were going to have to come face to face with the crone, part of me was like... (laughs) I've never been this scared, even when I was six and saw that terror vision movie that left some very horrific images in my mind and made every shape in the darkness move and come to life. But another part of me was in the zone of, this is another part of Ostium, coming after you, just like the blackness, trying to stop you. Will it succeed? Possibly. But you're going to do what you can to fight back. Maybe you'll win. Maybe you'll lose. But if you do, you're going to die trying. The sheer power the Chrome possessed was overwhelming that's the best word for it I'm pretty sure Dave will agree with me on that point outgunned and outmaneuvered an expression they like to use in movies when they get their asses handed to them or something like that yeah it was sort of like that and sort of like living in Australia okay hear me out for a moment 
The number of extremely poisonous and venomous and downright scarifying in the sense that you will be killed creatures living on one substantial Australian landmass is astounding. I know, I know. Over 20 million people live there. They walk around. They live in houses. They swim in the warm waters in the ocean. And they don't get killed by any of these pesky, lethal beasties. But I'm just imagining standing on that continent and wondering what might be watching me at every moment, waiting to sink its claws or fangs or other sharp, venomous protrusions into me. And where the hell was I going with this? The crone. We felt helpless against her, overwhelmed by her powers, whatever they might be. It was her sheer presence, her approaching form, the aura of doom stretched far and wide to us. We needed to find a way out, somehow, or it was all going to be over, like that. We'd just be ripe pickings for her, lying there forlorn and helpless, just like she wanted, no doubt. So I used that small part of me, the part that still had hope, to find a way, to come up with a way, to just do something. That small part of me was feeling good about those men I saved, the soldiers, sending them through an ostium I created, a new door to their place of origin, where they wanted to go, and preventing the crone from getting at them. I made that door a reality for them. Therefore, there wasn't any reason I couldn't make it a reality for us, too. I don't know where it actually took them, but I knew I'd made it happen. If I did it once, I could do it again. Yes, it takes focus and concentration and a considerable amount of energy to carry out. I was wiped after doing that one for the men. It had to be big enough for them to fit through and last long enough for all of them, which is why I pretty much just passed out afterward for a little while. And that's why I was only able to make a small ostium, a small doorway just big enough for each of us to essentially squeeze through, which I did. And we did make it through. Barely. And... That's how we ended up in the warm, sunny climes of the Rock of Gibraltar. (sighs) Oh. Oh, shit. Shit, shit, shit. I feel something's happening to me again. And I don't know what the fuck it is. Again! Thank God Jake gave me some time alone. To to think. To to try to put the pieces together. He's probably doing the same bloody thing right now. (sighs) Fuck. Okay. Keep it together, mate. Let's try and make some sense of this. Let's... Let's try starting at the beginning. Well, not the complete beginning. The beginning of... (laughs) the current shitstorm. She... No, not she. There was nothing human about it. I might have thought it was an old woman, a crone, but the way it moved, the way it spoke, the voice, I've never... Well, I've never heard or seen anything like it before. Obviously. I was shitting myself. Not literally, thank God. But hearing it, knowing it was coming closer, coming for us... And what it might do. Lots of things going through my mind. Very fucking scary things. But but Jake did it, somehow. He got those soldiers out. Did the impossible. In that room, I thought that was it. I thought we were done for. I half gave up. No, I did give up. Fully and completely. I thought it was the end. And soon we were going to be its playthings. Shortly to be experiencing new levels and ways of pain. But Jake did it, somehow. He used whatever willpower he had left, dragged me along, and then opened another fucking door, a small one, and got us through. Somehow, just in time, I was waiting for its its talons to grasp my ankles and pull me back from that opening, that ostium, that door to freedom. But we made it. And now we're here. Gibraltar, Jib, the rock... I lied to Jake. I have been here before. Once. When I was on holiday on the Costa del Sol. Spent a day taking the hydrofoil across to Tangiers, and a day visiting Jib, this little piece of England. A home away from home. It was nothing special, really. Lots of British things. Lots of people speaking English. So, not that different, really, from Spain. Like I said, nothing special. 
Nothing that would have helped Jake at all. It's not like I can tell him where certain places are. I went to the shops, had lunch at a pub, and then went back to my hotel across the border. I still feel uncomfortable about it. Guilty. I know. I could easily walk over to him right now and make things kosher, but what's done is done, and I'm going to leave it at that. So let's talk about the other fox in the hen house. Yes, you heard me right. I'm dealing with more than one at the moment. Fuck me, I know. So the other thing I'm trying to wrap my mind around is what I'm feeling being back here, in Gibraltar. It's not that I've been here once before, a long time ago. It's that I'm going through a series of emotions, being here again, feelings and thoughts, strange pictures flickering through my mind. It's all the sort of stuff that would inform a bloke he's back in his old haunts. A place he definitely called home at some point in his life. As far as I know, I've spent a whole, what, four hours here in my entire life? So riddle me this, Batman. Why am I having all these feels when I look down the street we're standing on? Why do I know that the street we're standing on is called Devil's Tower Road? I know, it's an unusual name. But this street looks like any old street. And I can see a sign over there in the distance telling me I know exactly where I am. Why do I feel I've cast my gaze over these buildings lots of times before? So many times that they've become mundane to me. Normal. Why am I casting my gaze up, up to the very top of the rock where I can see a very strange looking building? And I think my brain just turned over in the skull. I'm experiencing a very strong sense of deja vu right now. Double deja vu. Because, because in my mind, I can remember looking up there to the top of that very iconic mountain when I last visited here, and not seeing that strange thing up there. There were some aerial thingies, and that was it. Except, except, seeing that fucking strange looking building up there feels in tune with everything else I'm looking at around it. It too feels familiar, and comfortable and correct, part of the natural facade here. I turn around in a slow circle, and then feel something else pulling at me, setting off certain synapses in my brain. Jake? Jake! I yell at him. He turns and looks at me. I have a lot of shit going on with me mentally right now. I'm sure you do too. But there's something really fucking weird going on with me. I need to ask you a favor, mate. I need you to follow me. Keep up, I'm going to be going pretty fast. And then I'm off, chasing a thought that should be a memory for me, but both is and isn't some fucking how, because I can't actually remember experiencing it for the first time. It's... it's a very weird fucking feeling. I just hope I don't go completely bonkers when I find out what it actually is. I'm following Dave, and I have no clue where we're going. He shouldn't have a clue either, but he's walking like he knows, with determination. I don't know. The guy's walking like he has a plan, and since I've got bupkis, I'm all legs and feet, and I'm following him. It feels weird here. The aforementioned weirdness aside, there's something just off about this place. It's not that it's a totally foreign country to me, because it obviously is. But no, it's something more. This place has a, I don't know, like a future feel to me. Not distant future, but near future. Everything looks clean and shiny and sleek. I know, there's no people here, so that makes sense. But I can't quite put my finger on it. I can see the buildings, I can see the asphalt road I'm walking on, and yet they seem unusual to me, not quite right. I'm looking at this one building I'm walking past. It's got five floors by the look of it. Lots of windows, a few balconies, all normal stuff, right? But as I look at it, I'm noticing the edges of the buildings are all rounded. When I think of buildings in my head, I picture corners. Four corners to a building, perfect 90 degree angled sides, not rounded edges going from bottom to top. And the facade of the building, it's not brick. It doesn't look like a concrete outer layer. It doesn't even look like paint, actually. It's a reddish color, like a dark red, and it's shiny, reflective. 
Almost looks like a plastic polymer, which is just crazy for the outside of a building, right? The windows are dark black, so one way probably, but they look too black. Not dark like the fancy windows people have in their cars. They, they don't really look like glass. Is that even possible? As for the road, I said asphalt, but I don't know what in the hell it's made of. It's a gray color, pretty light. It's also sort of springy. With each step, I can feel it push down a little with my weight, then lift up as I raise my foot. So what, rubber? Chewing gum roads? And before me, I can now see water. Not that weird, right? When I picture Gibraltar in my head, it's a little like San Francisco, a promontory of land sticking out into the waters of, in this case, the Mediterranean. But I know enough basic geography, at least when it comes to the Iberian Peninsula. <laughs> Guess those many hours of geoguesser finally paid off or something, right? Emphatic wink wink. To know that the mountain of Gibraltar, the pillar of Hercules, is sort of on the outer edge of the town or colony or whatever it is. All the buildings and people pretty much live on the side facing Spain, so to speak. Meaning the direction we're headed in is towards the border, towards the mainland. Meaning there should be water surrounding the mountain and town, but where we're headed should be nothing but land. I think there's even supposed to be an airport somewhere near here, along with a border crossing, and that's not what I'm seeing. Dave's face is telling me he thinks something's not right in the state of Gibraltar as well. Okay, we're at the water's edge now, and yeah, it's definitely not right. Where there should be land, there's water, and I'm not just talking a little, like a stream or even a river in between. No, the land belonging to the considerably sized country known as Spain is nowhere to be found. I'm looking all around the horizon where I see water and there's absolutely no sign of land anywhere. Okay, now I'm starting to get scared. What the fuck's going on here, Dave? He turns to me, bewilderment is plain on his face as if it were a pie I'd just thrown at him. Yeah, I know, that's a pretty bad metaphor, but it's because I'm kind of freaking out right now. It's... it's a bloody island! What? It's a bloody island, mate. You know, a bit of land with water all around it. I know what a fucking island is, mate. But last time I checked, Gibraltar was very much not an island and very firmly attached to the big and very unmissable country of España. Dave just stares at me. Doesn't say anything. Then he sort of shrugs his shoulders and turns back to the water. It's a very smart move because I'm getting more pissed off as time passes. It's how I'm dealing with this situation, apparently. If he kept talking, I might have punched him. And the last time I did something like that, I don't know, middle school? Very long time ago. But Dave turning around immediately diffuses the situation. I'm confronted by all that water again, and it shuts me the hell up, almost as if I just went and doused my head in it. There's also proof that Gibraltar didn't just decide to separate itself from mainland Spain for some reason, or... Like a really bad earthquake caused it to happen somehow. In front of us is a wooden dock, solidly built, about 30 feet long. There are stanchions. Looks like a space for one big boat or a couple small ones. But its presence is very permanent. This dock has been here a while, which means Gibraltar has been in this way for some time. And that's when there's this loud, distant booming sound that echoes off the rock of Gibraltar for a long time. Dave and I spin around and face the rock, the town, and the buildings laid out before us. It was deep and echoing, but unlike anything I've really heard before, I have no clue what it is. I'm searching the skyline just above the buildings for a cloud of anything. Smoke, dust, a radioactive cloud. Sorry, that last one was in poor taste. What the bloody hell was that? Uh, I don't know, man. I've never heard anything like it. You? No, mate. I'm looking for any signs of it. Smoke or something, but I can't see anything. Can you? Looks all clear to me. Bloody scary, that's for sure. Yeah. I'm glad we haven't made a really dumb decision to split up yet. Hearing that on my own would have... It would have been bad. 
Do you want to go separate ways then? No, no. Um, I was just saying it was really fucking scary hearing that. And I'm, I'm really glad you're here with me. Dave raises his hand and offers a fist bump. I complete it, not wanting to leave the guy hanging. It helps break the mood. You know what? What? I'm bloody famished. You know, now that you mention it, I could totally go for some grub about now. Know any good places in town? He gives me a look questioning whether I'm being serious or not. I give a slight shake of the head and he starts smiling again. Not a bloody clue, but it can't hurt to have a look now, can it? Lead the way. Your guess is as good as mine. We both take one last look at the deep waters before us, then start walking back into town. I don't really know if I have a poker face, but when I got to the water's edge, I wasn't as surprised as I should have been. I put on a performance for Jake, and I think he believed me. The double deja vu sense isn't going away, not at all. If anything, it's getting stronger. It's making me come to terms with the fact that I just have to accept. (sighs) All the evidence is pointing towards it. I've been here before, in this Gibraltar, this other Jib. I know it's not the one I visited lots of years ago. It's different. Feels more modern. Might even say futuristic. And since we got here via a device that's known for travelling through time, it really shouldn't be that surprising, should it? It's still bloody disconcerting, though. Coming to grips with me being here before, but still not able to remember under what circumstances. I suppose I just have to trust that my mind will unfurl all those memories eventually. They keep coming to me in bits and pieces, random images, no people in them, yet. I'm hoping that will change. The sooner the better. Remembering a specific someone being here will do wonders for the cognitive recall. For now, I'll just keep muddling along. We've been walking for quite a while now, not really saying anything to each other. I think Jake is still working on taking all this in. It's a big deal for him. For me too, obviously, but especially for him. He had his heart set on Ostium, completely and utterly. He probably thought he was going to live out his days there. And now all that's gone. I wonder if he's thought about it yet. You know, the fact that he might never be going back there. He could do his fancy magic and make a door back there, possibly. I don't know. It took a hell of a lot of mojo to get the door to here. It's not an easy thing, obviously. Probably bloody hard to get the door to go exactly where you want it to go. And when, too. So that might be it for Jake and Ostium, then. Big bloody deal, that. I actually really hope he hasn't considered it yet. It's going to start him on a downward spiral. Definitely. Oh, look. Here's a big building. One story. Looks pretty promising. Oi, Jake. I've got a feeling about this one. I point to where I mean, and the smile that lights up his face is like a burst of fresh sunshine after some English rain. Does wonders for the Constitution. at the door and I do the honors. I feel like it's my duty or something. There's a handle which I turn, but nothing moves. I pull and feel a little give, so I give it a yank. With a hermetically sealed whoosh, the door opens and we go in. Nice job, Dave. Hole in one. It's a big room with lots of tables and chairs. They all look to be some sort of white plastic, but glossy. Everything looks shiny and clean. Not a scratch or speck of dust in sight. Hey, Dave. Notice anything weird about this place? Dave's looking around, trying to figure out what I'm getting at. Um, not really. Give us a clue? The lights are on, but nobody's home. Oh my god, you're bloody right! 
I didn't catch it right away, so when I did, it made me take a deep breath. The lights are all on, giving us the full view of the room. There's a long counter, and behind it a door that presumably leads to the kitchen. I can hear humming coming from that direction. Sounds like everything's up and running on kosher. I can hear the fridges and freezers singing their chilly symphony in the kitchen. <laughs> That's pretty good, Dave. I like that. Uh, garçon, could I see a menu, please? <laughs> uh, no, no, monsieur. That will not be necessary. You will take a seat. Tout sweet, s'il vous plaît. And shall I prepare the chef's special, which will be the most exquisite meal you have ever tasted? <laughs> and be snappy about it, kid. Giggling to himself, Dave disappears into the kitchen. I walk slowly around the room, trying to spot anything I might have missed on our first entering. Doesn't look like it. Everything seems pristine and well-kept. Impeccable is a word that comes to mind. I head behind the counter and start looking through cabinets above and below. I soon find the glasses, though cups is a more accurate description. Long and tall and made of something that isn't glass, but also isn't just plastic. Something else completely. Now I'm on the hunt for a beverage. I'm sure I could find a faucet and get some water, but this place seems to be of a high caliber, so I'm hoping to score big. After opening many doors, I find a number of drinks and refrigerators, though nothing's labeled, which I think is a little weird. I grab a bottle, like the cup. It's not glass or plastic, and study the top, trying to figure out how to open it. I try a clockwise, then counterclockwise twist. The latter does the trick, and there's a hiss of escaping carbonation. Oh, baby. I grab another for Dave, as well as a cup. Then I look for an icebox. Doesn't take long, and I'm shocked to find it well stocked. Score. I choose a table in the center of the room and pour our drinks. I sit and get comfortable. I take a sip, feeling the bubbles go up my nose and make my eyes water. It's heavenly. It's some sort of cola, like the cup and bottle It's in in between. Not Coca-Cola, but not Pepsi either. But it tastes fucking great. I take a long second drink, knowing there's lots more where this came from. That's when Dave comes through the kitchen door with two plates of steaming hot food. The smell quickly pervades the room, and my stomach immediately starts making some very audible noises. He puts the plates down, and I stare in head-over-heels love at big steaks, boiled potatoes, and... Is that broccoli? It looks a vibrant green and incredibly fresh. Dave is back again with silverware. We sit down to eat both grabbing our drinks and toasting. Welcome to Gibraltar. Then we start eating. I attack the broccoli first, and it's as juicy and delicious as it looks. The potatoes are soft and already have salt and pepper. The steak is medium rare and just wonderful. As I savor each bite, I notice Dave's steak is well done. (laughs) He is British, after all. I'm all full up. That meal was just an absolute joy. Definitely the best thing I've eaten in... (sighs) God knows. Probably my entire bloody life. I knew Jake would want his meat rare and bloody. Me, I like mine cooked all the way through. Call me old-fashioned. I'm cleaning up now. I insisted Jake stay in his seat. Told him I'd see if I could come up with some sort of dessert. I had to tell him I was on the hunt for some spotted dick. Couldn't avoid that one, could I? And Jake knew what I meant. Had a right laugh about it, bless him. I didn't tell Jake about the packaging the meat was in. It had a, well, not really a sell-by, but more of an eat-by date. It said the 14th of January, and the year was... 2105. I know. I couldn't fucking believe it when I saw it. I was right, though. This place is in the future. A lot farther than I thought. I don't know about telling Jake. If I should. When I should. It's a lot to take in. No. I will tell him. Just not yet. After the meal's all done. So, it's while I'm cleaning things up that I find the rubbish bin. To throw away the packaging and other bits. It's in a logical spot, so it doesn't take me long to find. I open it. Glance into it. Then drop what's in my hands. I start walking away, and like a cliché cartoon character, I stop. I slowly walk back to the bin and open it up again. I take out each piece of rubbish I threw in. It's the two of us, so not a lot. 
I know what each piece is. It all comes out. Then I look back in the rubbish bin. At the bottom is more packaging and some other rubbish. I take it out. It's packaging for chicken and for vegetables. And at the very bottom is an empty bottle of wine. I have a sniff, then turn it over. A few drops come out. Someone's been here. Recently. The dawn woke me. It was one of those cliche moments where I didn't remember where I was. Then I did. I was in a fucking cemetery. I dragged myself up into a standing position. Used a tombstone to do it. Steve's tombstone. It hits me again. I almost end up on the ground again. I feel a million years old. New aches and pains I didn't know I could have. Fuck, I feel old. My 56 years on this planet are catching up with me, osteum network enhancements aside. But then that's what I get for spending the night on the very hard ground of a fucking cemetery that was never supposed to be here. Like I said before, nothing like this was ever talked about or discussed. At least not with me. Not in any of those many, many hours of classes. It would have been covered somewhere. Orientation at the very least. So what does this tell me? That all those fuckers at the Ostium Network have been lying to me all along? Well, that's true anyway. What about this? Lying to all of us? No, I don't think so. In fact, I know so. This cemetery may be kind of out of the way when it comes to the topographical layout of this town, but we wouldn't have missed this. We couldn't have missed this. Not something this big. And I know it's got a lot of... unexpected new members, shall we say? But the space is still laid out like a cemetery. It's not like they expanded it or anything. So what does that mean, then? Pretty obviously, really, dear Watson... This isn't the same Gibraltar, or Ostium Network, or whatever the fuck you want to call it. It's a different one. Somehow. Somewhen. Yeah. Pretty fucking heavy. So what does that mean, exactly? Things are going to be the same here, like they were before. And also not the same. Different in some way. I haven't seen anything, yet, that tells me it's a different Ostium network. I mean, fuck. My goddamn journal sounded right. Still the same. If... If... A different me had recorded that entry, used slightly different language, word choices, phrasing. Would I have been able to spot it? Recognize that shit? You know, I'd like to think so. No. I fucking know so. So it just means... There was another me here in this other Ostium network. And this other me was real close to me, so we're just going to take that as a given. But... 
But this isn't another door. Another place that Ostium takes you to. This is the Ostium Network. It's not just some place you visit. This is where it all started. The be-all and end-all. Ground Zero. Patient X fucking Typhoid Mary. Yeah, that last one was a stretch. Learned about that during some random historical reading. For fun. So where the hell is everyone? Why does this feel like I just went through another routine ostium door? Even though I never did by myself. And found everyone mysteriously gone on the other side. What the fuck? I don't know. I might never know. Let's file this one with all the other Ostium-related unanswered questions. So what's the cemetery got to do with all this? It's a glaring difference to my Ostium network. The one where I used to live. The one where... Steve lived. Until he didn't. In this one, he's dead. So where does that leave my Steve? Oh, shit. He's... If he's still out there, in Ostium somewhere, behind one of those doors, he can't get back. And and if he somehow does, if that miracle somehow happens, he can't get here. And uh, I'm I'm never gonna see him again. <laughs> I'd fucking damn it. I could I could start attaching significance to everything that happens to me, to the events that come into play in my life, choices I consider and make, the decisions that lead me to oh so new and interesting places. I could attribute some higher power making all this shit happen. But I know I'd be lying to myself in every way possible. I've come this far. I've survived. On my own. I'm not going to start lying to myself now. So what can I get out of being here? What is there to gain? How can I make this fucking worthwhile? Well, if I had the choice of being stuck in Ostium or the Ostium Network, I'd choose this place any and every time. Everything is here. Somewhere. Like I said, this is where it all started where it got developed, where we first started learning, where the first time-traveling towns began, the first ostiums. It's all here, the answers. Finally. I just have to find them. And the good news is, I know my way around. I'm starting to fall into a routine here. It's been a couple of days. I got plenty of food, enough to last a lot of lifetimes. I'm staying in my place because... I I guess I could look around for a better pad. More room, fancier amenities, if such a thing exists. But I don't really need to. I'm perfectly satisfied with what I've got. I was before, I am now. Don't need anything more. Except some company. That would be nice. 
But I'm not exactly holding my breath on that. I'm doing a lot of walking. Feels great to get some exercise. The weather continues to be just wonderful. Air is fresh and clean with a good dose of brine. I've started doing some reading again. I've still got that ridiculous ebook library on my data pad, and it's still connected to the local area network here, so I've got access to everything just like usual. Yes, I did try contacting and messaging a bunch of different people and departments. No takers, no responses. I knew it wasn't going to be any other way. And I've started visiting the old haunts, all the places I went to before. For a couple of reasons. One, I want to see what they still look like, if they're exactly the same as I remember them. Two, I want to see if anything is different about them, since they're part of this other Ostium network, what might have changed in comparison to mine. And three, what can I learn from them? Is there something altered? A detail, a clue, a fact I didn't catch before. Something that can help me understand comprehend better and ultimately get me the fuck out of here I've encountered and overcome a lot of hurdles in my time in my life in Ostium so when I start hitting them again here in the Ostium network I'm not surprised I'm not phased I keep going because I don't give up even when I feel I've exhausted every fucking angle part of me keeps going keeps trying. I visit the classrooms. I visit the offices. I visit the rooms of my past. I check out every location I can remember I've ever been to in the Ostium network. I find data pads. Lots of them. Data pads plenty, And not a word of worth on any of them. Not a sentence of sense. Not a tidbit of temerity? Tusefulness? Jack shit, basically. Whoever Jack is. It's all stuff I already know, or didn't really need or want to know. A lot of stuff on the classes I took. A lot of personal stuff. Thoughts and ideas about time travel. About a favorite time to travel to. Some interesting thoughts, actually. But nothing useful. Nothing moving me a crucial step further. Just lots of ideas that keep everything in a holding pattern. Nothing moving forward. And a whole lot of people lusting after each other. Woman after men, woman after woman, and everything in between you can imagine. There was no outright no-sex policy, or an avoid fraternization at all costs. People like people. People like to fuck other people. You can't stop that, no matter how much you might want to. And I've definitely seen humanity try, like those religious nuts in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. But it's still another thing to be reading people's very personal thoughts. Ah! My eyes! Yeah. But I had to check them all. Had to be sure. For all I knew, one of them could have somehow belonged to someone high up in the echelons of the Ostium network. Maybe even Mr. Head Honcho himself. Ah, not him. That guy wouldn't leave something that valuable hanging around. The Ostium Magna Carta for anyone to get their grubby fingers on. So, maybe something then. Nope. I don't know if it's because of this particular place, this Ostium network. Did things like recording crucial pieces of information on your datapad just not happen here? Did they happen in any version of the Ostium network? (sighs) So... So, I need to untangle that thought a little. Really wish I had Jakey here to bounce my thoughts off of. I'm sure he'd be happy to offer up a lectured paragraph for ten. But if his resurrection were unlikely in Ostium, it's a million years beyond that here. This idea of multiple Ostium networks, multiple iterations of places in time, it was certainly discussed in a number of the classes on traveling through time. 
none of them cohesively linked up with whatever the engineers and scientists and specialists were doing in Ostium. And none of us asked. We were too... What's the word? Gobsmacked by everything. There were some things I would question and ask for more info on, more specifics. But this... This conceptualizing was way beyond me and my ken. So I kept mum. Wish I hadn't now. Wish a fucking lot. So let's try and bring it down to our level. You have your straightforward time travel shenanigans. Your linear chronological type. Your Marty McFly traveling back and finding his mom has the hots for him, which really fucks with the space-time continuum, and he starts to go all invisible man. That's the one that gets covered in a lot of books and movies and pretty much all of pop culture. Bill and Ted did a great job, especially that bit when one of them wants something, then it appears because he went back in time and made it happen, but you don't have to see it, the item just appears. So that's your straightforward variety of time travel. The other one, as I understand it, is a sort of parallel universe one, a tangential one if I'm using that word correctly. I think I am. Which is that each time a choice is made, a decision decided on, multiple timelines begin from that point. One in which the decision went that way, and one in which the choice went the other. The two are separate, and from then on, individual. And I think the two can never meet or cross over each other. I think. It's all pretty highbrow theoretical physics for me. So in this scenario, Marty McFly can go back and have a grand old time with his mother, if he wants, and not cause any problems with the space-time continuum. Well, no, that's not right, exactly. If I'm following this right in my head, now there won't be any time problems with his timeline, because the tangent happened after he traveled to his past and messed with it starting on its own course, while his actual timeline, where he resides, is perfectly fine. I don't know if I made any sense there. It doesn't really sound like it, to me. But I think I kind of get it, at least. The timey-wimey stuff still gets messed up, but only on specific tangents. So this Ostium network is on a different time tangent to the one I originally came from. Yeah, that's it. And so everyone is gone in this one. In mine, well, who knows what happened after I went through and fucked up their game plan. But people should still be there. Here it's a different story. Apparently. It's like being on the other side of a door in Ostium, with everyone gone. And none of us ever found out what the hell the deal was with all of that. Were all these people all of a sudden being zapped into non-existence? being sent somewhere else? Another timeline, perhaps? Something. It never made sense. But thinking they were all being obliterated? Atomized? That just didn't feel right. It's too much. Too far-fetched. Even if that was the road Jake kept sending himself down. So, is it the same deal here? In this Ostium network? But this isn't the door in Ostium. This is separate from that, a level above it, a step before it. Without this place, there is no Ostium, so it can't be that. But thinking back to that cemetery, there were an awful lot of headstones there. It was a thriving place of the dead. And compared to my Ostium network, where there was no such place, it was an impossibility. So maybe they had something big happen here. Before, Ostium took its first victim. A sickness, maybe. Something they couldn't control, couldn't predict. And people started dying. A lot of people. For some reason. And there wasn't anything they could do about it. They couldn't bring in outsiders to help. No doctors or military or whatever they thought might help to solve the problem. And they couldn't send everyone out either. Send them back to wherever they came from. It needed to be contained. And if they didn't understand what was going on, they couldn't afford to send people back to the real world. Maybe it was contagious, whatever it was. And that's when the scary thought drops into my mind like a stone into a pond. 
What if it's still contagious and still here? I've never been one to shirk my duties. I thrive on facing things head on. Facing fucking reality, no matter how real it might be. I'm stuck here. There's nothing I can do about it. If there's some shit in the air here that's going to kill me, then that's that. In the meantime, I'm going to enjoy myself as much as I can, which also means taking care of myself, too. Which leads me to something I haven't talked about before. Something the Ostium Network did let us know about shortly after we started working here. And it's something I've never heard anyone, man, woman, or other, ever turn down. Honestly, it pretty much makes up for them taking away our implants as soon as we got here. I'm gonna need a moment before I start talking about this. And a drink. I didn't notice it till yesterday, in all my time in Ostium. Being with Jake, being that way with Jake... Going through all those doors, facing oncoming death and blackness, being scared shitless. No, the thought never came into my head. But yesterday, I saw a number of the spots had returned to my hands. They look like biggish moles. One looks kind of gray. Mostly they're brown, nothing really alarming. Perfectly ordinary for someone who's spent their time on this lump of rock, hurtling through time and space for over 56 years. Yes, some call them... liver spots. I've never been a fan of that term, but they are a normal sign of old age. And honestly, when the Ostium Network said they really wanted me, at my age, I was shocked. Really shocked. But I still wasn't going to turn down an opportunity like this, especially not if I got to work with my son. It wasn't like it said, must be able to lift over 50 pounds on the application. So I knew I'd be okay. And the sheer excitement I got from the mystery surrounding the job and by how much they wanted me meant I could never turn them down or look back. And I didn't. By the way, I can totally lift 50 pounds, 60 even. And so... A month into our training, one by one, we met with a doctor and had a specific procedure explained to us, and we're given the option of saying yay or nay to it. Like I said, as far as I know, no one ever said nay. In the time I'm from, which is coming in on the end of the 21st century, I don't know why I'm keeping this number a secret, but it's a little something, a little increment, a tidbit that only I know and you don't. Longevity and health has made some great strides, and it's now fairly common for people to make it to 100 years of age. How they get there and what sort of health they're in physically and mentally remains to be seen. So I met with the doctor, a young, vivacious-looking sister. I figured it was another routine checkup. We hadn't been poked and prodded enough when we first arrived, so now it was time for a little more sadism. But she sat me down in a cushy seat at her desk and told me about how the Ostium Network had made many advancements in many fields, including that of health and longevity. As an employee for the Ostium Network, there were certain procedures available to me, if I wanted them. Then she started spouting a bunch of medical jargon, and I felt like I was back in class. She said shit about telomeres a lot, whatever those are. At the end, she put it in nice, clear terms. If I chose to go through all three of the procedures, I would come out the other end looking and feeling 20 years younger. And there were no side effects whatsoever, other than my peers being shocked at how fine I would look now. I said sure. I was already fully aware of the number of young people employed by the Ostium Network. What better way to level the playing field? Am I right? It took three hours. Some painless injections, some medications, then 90 minutes in a special chamber that filled with this goo. I was fitted with a breathing mask, stripped down to my birthday suit, and got comfortable. Fortunately, the goo was warm. It was pretty relaxing, actually. 
I took a nice nap and they woke me when I was done. And they were totally fucking right. I looked in my mid-thirties and I couldn't believe it. I felt awesome. Just great. And like I said, everyone had this done to smooth away wrinkles, energize muscles, and look a little younger and healthier, even if they were in peak physical condition with looks to boot. Steve shaved off a year or two. But I was one of the elderly few who turned the clocks back a lot. There were a lot of heads turning my way after that. After it was all done and I was dressed back in my now looser-fitting clothes, the doctor sat me down again and explained how this wasn't a temporary thing, that the process could be done repeatedly, indefinitely. I don't think I fully processed the true meaning of this statement until... Perhaps now? Maybe because I didn't believe it? Maybe because no one did, but did it anyway. (laughs) She just said, basically, that we could all live forever, if we wanted. We could become immortal. The caveat was that we always had a choice in this. It was never chosen for us. This wasn't going to be an immortal existence doomed to never be able to die. When one wanted to kick the bucket willingly, they certainly could. Not to mention all the other common and popular ways some choose to end their lives or have their lives ended for themselves. I was told that the best and most effective treatment was an hour goo bath every six months. A paltry price to pay for looking this fucking badass. I'd surpassed the six-month mark was closing in on a year, actually. So it only made sense some of my body's cells were now starting to feel their age. The first question was, did the goo bath exist in this osteum network? And was it still working? The second question was, did I still want to? Fuck yeah, was the resounding response to the second one. Answering the first question took a little longer as I had to remember what room the goo baths were located in what building. I did find it pretty quick. Everything was running like normal. And fortunately, I'd had the procedure done enough times to know the actual operating of the bath was something even I could handle. In a few minutes, I had everything powered up and running, and the purple filling up just right. When it was ready, I set an alarm, stripped down, and like Goldilocks, stepped into the just right goo with the respirator running and got comfortable. I didn't sleep this time. I didn't trust that nothing would go wrong. When the alarm went off, I was up and out of there and going through cleaning procedures according to protocol. Before I put my clothes back on, I checked the full-length mirror, which was simply required in this room. I looked 36 again, and amazing. Like before. I couldn't help winking at myself. The doctor had told me there were some more severe procedures that could increase the aging retraction to up to 30 years, but with those were potential side effects and irregularities. (laughs) That last word had me staring well clear of that risk. 20 was just fine for me. And then I was back in my familiar apartment after a nice long hot shower with a steamy mug of tea, contemplating on the next steps I could take and making the nightly journal entry. Before I looked at entering the world of buildings and offices and locations I'd never been before in the Osteum Network, there was one last place I hadn't been that I'd have to make myself check. Steve's place. His place isn't too far from mine. I haven't forgotten where it is. (laughs) Some things you can't forget. But it is far enough that it's a bit of a walk. I take the EV and I'm there in minutes. It takes me twice as many minutes to leave the vehicle and make it to the door. Then I'm stopped in my tracks. The door is half open. What the fuck? 
It's just like mine with the ID pad, just like all the others along the street. All those doors are closed. How come this one isn't? I step into the doorway, pushing it open. It doesn't make a sound. Good. I go inside and take slow steps, keeping as quiet as possible and listening for anything. Or anyone. I enter the living room and then I just wait. Five minutes pass, then ten, then fifteen. In all that time, I keep perfectly still. I hear nothing but my own breathing. I relax then, check out the other rooms just to be certain. I'm alone here, as I expect to be. Then the emotion washes over me like a wave I can barely stand up against. This is where he lived, where he was. His smell is here, in every room. In his bedroom, his bed is still unmade. I'm unable to stop myself from smelling his pillow. (laughs) That starts to tears. I look in his closet, where his smell is even stronger. More tears come then, and I just let them fall. In the living room, I sit on the single couch and have a long, good, healthy cry, feeling the sobs wrenched from me and thrown away, not wanting them back. More time passes, and I'm able to get myself back together. I feel my hand reaching over to the lamp on the small table next to the couch. I've sat in this exact spot many times with my lovely son. Beneath the lamp is a framed photograph of us. It got taken not long after we arrived at Ostium, and we asked to have prints, and each got one along with frames. We keep them in the same spots in our respective apartments. Some might think it's kind of sappy. It was Steve's idea. I thought it was beautiful and was really touched by the gesture except my hand's not finding the photo. I turn and I look, and and beneath the lamp is no photo. There was a photo there before, most fucking definitely. I can still see a thin layer of dust on the table. Where the frame was are marks and grooves in the dust. Tracks indicate the photo has been taken. What the fuck? Someone's been here. And for the first time, being back in the Ostium Network, where I thought I was all alone, I start to feel afraid. And that's when another loud fucking boom happens. That meal was exquisite, the quintessential cliché, a meal fit for a king, and I was full, satiated. I didn't want another bite. I tried to remember a meal on par with this, and the first thing that comes to mind is that lunch Monica and I had in Cavallo. Yeah, that was a good meal, almost as good as this one, except um, with different people. And would I be okay sitting here in this strange place with Monica, or Dave and Monica, the three of us? After everything that's happened between me and her, after everything she did to me, and everything that happened after, with her, and to me, would I still want her here with me right now? (laughs) In a heartbeat. Dave took a while to find some dessert, which was fine by me. I needed to make some room in the stomach region if you catch my drift. When he came back out eventually, he had a tray of flan. I couldn't help laughing. We were in a magical place that, to the best of my knowledge, didn't exist anywhere in the known world. And after enjoying a truly out-of-this-world steak, although that may have had something to do with my not having had something as good as steak in a really long time, plus we were no longer in the known world, seeing the final course, the piece de resistance, the... Dessert to end all desserts. Flan. Well, 
I guess it makes perfect sense in a way. The actual rock of Gibraltar is part of the southern coast of Spain, where flan is as common as paella and flamenco, right? This may be a different rock of Gibraltar, an alternate one, perhaps on another plane of existence. But the Spanish influence is still there, that's for sure. Dave had this worried look on his face when he came out from the kitchen, like he'd just found a human head in the... Well, you know, let's just not go there. It still hasn't been long enough. As if he'd just seen a ghost. Is there something wrong, Dave? Was the flan hard to find? He takes a while to respond. His mind is clearly on something. The eyes aren't focused, glazed over. What the hell happened in there? Dave? He snaps back to attention, looking at me. Um, it's... It's the food. I noticed something weird with it. That's when alarm bells start ringing for me. What do you mean? What we just ate? Am I about to get fucking food poisoning? No, no. Nothing like that. At least, I don't think so. No, it's not that. I'm definitely sure it isn't. It's just bloody weird. I saw it when I was cleaning up, throwing away all the packages the food was in. It was all perfectly organized, everything was packaged, and on all those packages was an expiry date. Oh shit. You missed that? It was expired, wasn't it? No. You see, that's the thing. They're not expired. Absolutely not. They're... (laughs) They're a long fucking way from expired, in fact. Oh? Oh, that's what? Really? Yeah, but get this. I'm not just talking about a few months from expiring, or even a few years. What? How about 80 years? What the fuck? No. I'm being serious. And how the hell can you tell? That would be like in the year 2100. Don't they just have double digits for that year? No, mate. The entire date is printed on the package. No fucking way. He stares at me then, angry all of a sudden. Follow me. I follow him into the kitchen and he opens the refrigerator and steps back, waiting. I take him up on the offer, reaching in and grabbing a mysterious package of brown meat, another steak, different marinade, and there's the expiration date printed on the packaging, clear as day. May 22nd, 2103. I can't believe what I'm seeing. Holy fucking shit. Minutes pass, then more. I'm sorry, Dave, for doubting you. It's just so hard to believe. I know, mate. Couldn't believe it myself. Okay, good. I turn to him. We good? Yeah, BFFs. (laughs) Smashing. So, where are we headed next? He turns serious suddenly. Why are you asking me? It's okay, I don't mean anything by it. You know as much about this place as I do. Maybe, I don't know, maybe I want to take a step back from always being the first one through the door and making all the decisions, calling all the shots. Monica was great at getting shit done, but I was always the one that had to take the first step, make that first choice. I I want to let someone else lead for a change. Dave breaks into a smile. Okay, mate, just follow me then. I've got a few ideas. First, we start by having a look at all the buildings in the vicinity. Find out what they all are, what they're like, what's going on inside. I think that should give us some starting thoughts about what is actually going on in this bloody strange place. (laughs) That sounds fantastic. Amazing. Brilliant. Yeah, that too. No, I meant good. As in, glad you're happy with the idea. Oh, right. A Britishism. Rightio, let's get a move on then. Right behind you. He leaves the kitchen and I put the package of meat back in the refrigerator on top of all the others and close the door. It gives a nice sucking sound, airtight. I look at the row of refrigerators along the wall and then the others. Then I turn to the other end of the kitchen and see more, and other units that are probably freezers. There's a lot of fucking food here. More than you'd need for a rainy day. And with those ridiculous expiration dates, I don't know whether to half-believe or just prepare myself to be near the bathroom for the next day or two. No. If I'd have to guess, I'd say this is enough food for a decent-sized group of people for something like... the end of the world.
I'm, I'm starting to remember more things. Lots of things. About here. About being here with others. With friends. With my mum. In this place. This other jib. This alternate rock. I'm, I'm keeping ahead of Jake. I don't want him hearing any of this. Not at the moment, at least. Jake's had his own share of secrets, and going through his own thoughts to understand them completely. So now it's my turn. And... And I don't know what to think about this. What does it all mean? Are these memories that are slotting themselves back inside my head real ones? Real memories? Actual pieces of my past life? They feel like they are. Though, with everything that's happened... Here. Happening in Ostium. Happened to me personally. I... There's just no actual way I can definitely know. They feel correct. A part of me. Like they should be there, inside. Those memories of earlier times. More nightmares of killing those men when that entity had control over me. (sighs) Even though they're inside me too, they don't fit properly. Differently shaped pieces of the puzzle that don't match at all. But someone... Something has mashed them into the puzzle so they'll stay there. Even if they don't belong. So what am I to do? Stay the course for the moment. Just keep going and see what happens. I truly never know what's around the next corner in Ostium. And the same applies here, to the rock. Actually, just saying those words, the rock, it feels natural, as if it's the right way to say it. The comfortable way. I know it's been called Jib for a long time, but being here now, in this other rock, and saying it, It makes me feel like I've said it a lot of times before. And dare I say, I feel at home saying it and feeling it. Yes, I think I do. I have a vague idea, a vague sense for where I'm going. It's nothing as elaborate and detailed as those infrared maps Jake and Monica had in their heads. This is more intuition-based. A sense and feeling for where things are, where they're supposed to be. I suppose you'd call it a spidey sense? Didn't Jake have something like that happen to him right in the beginning? When he was first trying to find Ostium. I think I remember hearing him talk about being outside of Starbucks, in a car park, honing in on Ostium, or something. Well that's what this feels like, for me, right now. I have a strong sense where certain places and buildings are. Possibly because they're connected with these new memories that are being shoved into my head. Anyway, I'm not telling Jake what's been going on with me. Not yet. There's just too much happening with my thoughts and feelings and all that. I want to understand it all first, before I let Jake know what's going on with me. So that's why I cross the street with Jake in tow, stopping at the first building that's there. We find the front door and go in with no problem. Fifteen minutes later and we're all done. The bottom floor had a reception area, a waiting room, and some offices. Upstairs, and there was a lift, but we both decided we needed some exercise after ingesting all those calories. Our four doctor's offices with a full range of equipment and amenities. Fuck knows what it all does, but there's a lot of tech up there that makes me think this must be the equivalent of what a hospital is in this place. When something happened to you, whether it was a skinned knee or a broken arm, this is where you came to get help. They could do it all. If you needed a plaster, or a set of x-rays, or an MRI, they had the machinery and the ability to get the job done. We're outside now. Jake's walking around a bit, taking in what he's just seen in the building, and also having a look around. Getting a feel for the place, I suppose he'd say. And it's at about this time that a new memory falls into place in me old noggin. It's hazy, dreamlike, but I know it's me, from my life, my past. I can remember being in one of those hospital rooms, sitting on the bed, talking with a doctor, I presume. I'm in one of the hospital gowns. Must have been having stuff done to me. Can't really remember what. I remember talking to the doctor, telling her about myself, my medical history and stuff. It's still not that clear, but I feel comfortable, relaxed. So what I was going through must have been all right. Something I fully agreed to. Maybe it was from early on, when I first came here possibly. I just don't know. Like so much else here, 
but it's a step in the right direction. I'm starting to learn. I know more than I did before. This feels good, really good, great in fact. I know, it's not really that big a deal, but I meant what I said earlier when I told Dave how I felt like I'd been running the show and calling the shot since, well, since I set foot in Ostium, I guess. Monica is, I guess Monica was, is more accurate. She's still out there technically somewhere, so there's always a chance we'll meet again on some sunny day, an infinitesimal chance. Monica was awesome in many ways and in the many things she did for me and with me, for us. I've had time to think about it quite a bit. I'm obviously not happy with what she was doing to me, but I can also see where she was coming from, with Steve being her son, a parent looking for her child. It supersedes everything. I understand that. I've not forgiven her. I'm not over it yet, not by a long shot, but in time. The wounds will heal. And now I'm getting to step back a bit. I know, it doesn't seem that big of a thing, really. Letting Dave take the reins and decide on where we're going, in this place that neither of us knows anything about. But it kind of is a big deal for me, personally. It's allowing me to relax and not worry so much. Not that I was that much before, but it's felt like my foot has been on the throttle from the beginning. And that's because I've wanted it that way. That's that's how I am. I deliberately put myself in those positions because that's how and where I like to be. That's where I thrive, so to speak. And it feels like that's never let up, especially when I was having those memory problems courtesy of those deadly gloves Monica had. But now, we're in a new place. Things are different. We're not going through doors like before. There's no blackness coming after us here. And hopefully, that thing, that crone, won't be following us to this place, and it feels like the right time and the right place to ease off that accelerator, take a step back and just chill for a change. Of course, it's one thing to acknowledge and tell yourself to take it easy and another to actually do it. Yeah, I'm letting Dave go wherever he wants right now and I'm just following, learning as much about this place as he is. That hospital was interesting, definitely felt like I was in some sci-fi movie with how clean and simple everything looked. There were machines and tech, but not wires anywhere. No tools or objects sitting around. All clean and sterile and like a medical bay on the Enterprise. Pick the series. We start checking out other buildings. Don't have any problems getting in, but they're nothing special. Nothing really stands out, although I don't really know what to expect. Should something stand out? Am I looking for a special ostium door to be waiting for me? Open, inviting me to a world utterly different from this one? Is that because that's been my way of life for weeks now? This may be the never-before-discovered island of Gibraltar, but so far, other than the tech and feel of it being a good step into the future, it's all pretty mundane. When compared to a special little town that takes you through doors to different places in time and space. Just saying. It's been about a couple of hours, and we've checked out 16 other buildings, which have all been nothing special. Offices, classrooms, a gym, conference rooms, though we did see a couple of weird things that should be pointed out. In one room that was most likely an office, the desk and chairs had all been pushed to the side of the room, and in the center was the, this giant pentagram drawn in chalk. No, not drawn exactly, more like someone had made it by pouring chalk in the shape of the pentagram. In another room, this was a conference room, big table with lots of chairs. Except the chairs were all stacked up in the middle of the table in the shape of a tower. Dave actually walked up to it and reached out to touch the strange stack. I was about to yell at him not to, but nothing happened. The tower didn't fall down in a noisy cacophony as I'd expected. It didn't even move. Dave then shook it. Nothing. No movement whatsoever. I walked closer, wanting to know what the hell was going on here. They're fused. I didn't believe him. Again. But once I was standing next to him, I saw he was totally right. Not just the metal, but the plastic, too. It was like 
They'd been melted and become one solid mass and then rehardened. Fucking weird, man, were the only words I had to say. Emphatic nod from Dave. In the last room of the last building, this was the gym, and it was in the women's shower room. It wasn't immediately noticeable. We checked each shower stall, and we were about to leave when Dave said, Hang on a sec. I looked at him, eyebrows raised. Just, just be quiet for a minute and listen. So I did. I didn't hear anything. The hell was he talking about? There were no strange sounds, no weird... And then I did hear it. It was the showers, the shower heads. They were all dripping. A drop every few seconds. Nothing special except that all 12 showers were dripping. Not at the same time, but in sequence. But the sequence didn't repeat. Well, sometimes it did. Other times it didn't. It was a fucking song. The drip sounds were just different enough to make music somehow. It's music? Dave nodded. Damn. It's real familiar. I can almost guess it. Claire de Lune. That's it. We kept listening for a few more seconds, then we both looked at each other. It was really fucking creepy. We got the hell out of there. And now we've crossed the street and we're headed to what looks like townhouses? I don't know. I'm getting the residential vibe off of them. How they're in a long row along the street here, all numbered and all identical. We go up to the first one, and the door doesn't have a handle or anything. But there's a panel on the left, and now that we're standing in the door, well, it's lit up with a numerical light-up display. I try tapping in some numbers, but nothing happens. I look at Dave. He just shrugs. We check each townhouse along the street, and they've all got the same doorway, unsurprisingly. Each panel lights up as we reach the door. At the fifth door, Dave seems a little more excited. I'm not sure what it is, like he's expecting something with this door. But it's exactly the same as all the others. We step up to it, and the panel lights up. Tell you what, I want to try something here. You watch the door and let me know if anything happens. Sure, I say, willing to try anything at this point. Fuck all that's happening. I watch the door like I'm playing a game of GeoGuessr, impatiently waiting for something to materialize, some sign that I recognize. Why, thank you, yes, that was a good callback. I thought so, too. And as I'm joking around, there's an audible click, and the door pops open, just like that. I give Dave a look that you can probably easily imagine, but let me put it in perspective for you. It's that look you give your favorite band when you're seeing them live for the first time, and you won front row seats for free. He wiggles his fingers at me and says, Magic hands, mate. Then he steps in front of me and walks inside. I need to be ahead of Jake. It's for a reason. I know he's been letting me lead the way, which has worked out just fine in my book, but now it's more crucial than ever. Because I picked this particular pad for a big reason. A bloody big reason. You see, the memories keep coming to me as more time passes. And once I saw the row of houses, that reminded me a lot of my mother country, with them all joined together in a row. For the first time, I think, I actually recognize myself. I've definitely been here before, by myself and with other people. I can remember that. Not who I was with, but just having a physical presence here, in this exact spot, at one point. And when we went up to the first house, I knew immediately we weren't going to be able to get in, because you need a special code for that, a six-digit one. Jake tried a few things, which of course didn't work, and then we started moving on down the road from one house to the next. When we got to this one, 
I had to come up with something quick to distract Jake. Because I knew the code to get in. Because this used to be my house. Back when there were lots of people in this town. I can remember that now. I was one of them. And this was where I slept. Where I lived. And the code worked just like it always did. I charge up the stairs, going two at a time, and sometimes three, to get to the top as quick as possible. I can hear Jake coming up behind me, but not as fast. That's good. I don't know what I'm going to find at the top, but I'm not ready for Jake to know everything going on with me. Yet. I will tell him. Soon. I promise. Just not now. So I need to make sure there are no triggers here. Nothing bloody blatant that'll make it completely obvious to him. Stepping into the room truly feels like coming home to me. There's a blossoming warm feeling in my chest. I'm actually getting a little dewy-eyed. I blink a few times and have a look around. Everything seems pretty normal. A bit dusty, I suppose. Quite a bit, actually. But nothing out of the ordinary that says, Welcome to Shea Dave. Except for that bloody frame photograph on the table there. I've just got tens of seconds now before Jake's at the top of the stairs and looking in. I dive onto the sofa and grab the photo. Now what the hell am I going to do with it? I shove it down my trousers for now, the band of my boxers holding it decently in place. (sighs) Good, okay then. We need to be careful not to make any sudden moves, and especially watch it when sitting down. Fine, I just won't do that then. Jake's at the top of the stairs now, eyes on me, eyebrows raised in confusion. I'm still on the sofa. I mime grabbing my calf muscle. I knew I shouldn't have run up the stairs like that. I was just really excited at getting in and seeing the place. Charlie horse? You what? Uh, I mean, leg cramp. Oh, yeah, right. Me right calf. Give me a few minutes and I'll be fine. Jake nods and starts walking around the living room. I continue my acting bit, pretending to massage the muscle like it really hurts. After I've decided enough time has passed, I get up and follow Jake, who's already checked out the kitchen, and now he's in the bedroom. He's looking through the wardrobe. Lots of clothes hanging from coat hangers. My clothes. I recognize some of them instantly. Then Jake and I see the data pad on the bedside table. He gets there before me and picks it up. Shit. Hmm. He says, looking at it intently. Seems like it's password protected. You want to have a go? Sure, I say, taking it from his hands. I turn and leave the bedroom, letting out a deep breath. You know what? I come to a full stop and slowly turn around, worried. What? We should stay here, sleep here tonight. Use this as a place to rest. There's a bed and a couch. We could take turns. At least we'd have a roof over our heads and sleep comfortably. I think quickly. Don't want to take too long or he'll become suspicious. Sure, mate. That sounds smashing. Good idea. You ready to keep looking around? We've still got a good three hours of daylight left. Yeah, sounds good. Will you be able to get us back in here, or do we need to keep the door ajar? No worries, mate. Magic hands, remember? His smile is a good enough answer, and I am leading the way back down the stairs and out onto the street. I notice Jake leaves the door open a bit anyway. I'm alright with that. I've got somewhere very particular in mind I want to go next. The memory is making itself known to me now, and I think if I find what I'm looking for, it's going to go a long way to making me remember everything. And I've managed to move the frame around to my bum, where it's sitting much more comfortably. It's funny how one's outlook to the day can totally change when you know there's a soft piece of furniture waiting for you come nightfall. I didn't really know where we were going to sleep tonight. Pretty much everything we've seen so far has been hard chairs and hard tables and hard floor. This changes everything. Well, not really, but it makes things a lot better. Since we're going to be here for the indefinite future. Having a place to stay. What is it they say that the requirements for survival are? Water, food, and shelter, in that order. Check, check, and check. I feel like something's going on with Dave. I don't know what it is, but the longer we're here, the weirder he starts to act. 
like the way he ran up those stairs. He gave me an excuse, and I knew it was an excuse. The lie was painted clearly across his face. So what's he covering up? Apparently he knows something I don't, and it's big enough that he doesn't want to tell me. Well, I definitely know how he feels, so for the time being I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and see where he takes us next. That's another thing I've worked out about Dave. At first he was just checking out buildings, but somewhere along the way he found his path and knew where he wanted to go next, just like now. I don't know if he realizes it, but we're going past buildings we haven't checked yet. He's got a destination in mind, and I'm just going to go with it. And here we are, a nondescript building, unassuming, one like any other. The door is unlocked like the others, too, and we step inside. There's a sort of waiting room with a couch and a couple chairs and a desk. It feels like a waiting room at a small-time doctor or a dentist. But there's something off about it. Something not... Oh. Dave's seen it right away, and he's already standing in front of another door that grants one access to the next room. The one where the assistant comes in to bring you back to go through a normal opening. Here it's all about security and whether you're allowed back there or not. This door is also unlocked. So much for security. And Dave's already through and making his way down the hall. I have to speed up to keep close. We pass more doors, all closed. Then we reach a T-stop. He turns left without hesitation. I'm also jogging now. I could call out to him, yell his name, but I know it wouldn't do any good. The guy is locked in. He's got somewhere he wants to be. He knows where he's going, and nothing's going to stop him or slow him down. I'm just glad that I got invited along for the ride. And then we're in a booth with an instrument panel. There are no actual buttons, but I can tell what it is because it's lit up like the navigation station on the Enterprise. Above the panel is a big window looking into an unassuming room. Dave has stopped taking everything in, and now he's moving again over to the pressurized door that gives one access to the special room. Has he seen something I missed? I look back through the window and see plain walls and no furniture or objects in the room. And then I do see something, and take three steps to the right to get a better angle on it. There it is, along one of the walls. It's a door. A certain kind of door. An ostium door. It looks exactly like every single door I've ever seen there, without a number. Holy shit. Now I'm following Dave. He's got the door unlocked somehow, and as it opens, there's a sharp hiss. I follow him inside, and we both walk up to the door. He looks at me, and I'm surprised by the look on his face. He's not confused. He's confident. Aware. He knows what this door is. Why it's here. And what here is. And that's when we both hear another booming sound from outside somewhere. Okay, Dave. Time to spill the beans? What? I know you know what this place is. I don't. I don't have a fucking clue. You know that thing right there? He points to the door. It's really scaring the crap out of me. So what the hell is going on here? And how do you know about it? I take a long, deep breath. All right, Jake. I'm going to tell you. It's time. I'm going to tell you everything I know. Everything that's at least come back to me. But not here. What? Why? It holds too many memories for me. This room. This place. Let's go back to the house. We'll make dinner. And I'll tell you everything. Jake isn't saying anything. Thinking things over. Can't blame him. Then his fanny face clears, and he gives me a nod. But you're going to have to show me how the hell we get out of here, because I'm totally lost. He's smiling now, which is good. 
It makes me smile. Okay, mate, follow me.